to introduce the next speaker because she's not only a um, very talented researcher who works in an area of research that's very closely aligned to my interest, but she's someone that I like to call a collaborator and a friend. Um, Judith Prochaska is Associate Professor of Medicine with Stanford Prevention Research Centre at Stanford University. Dr. Prochaska's clinical trials research develops and evaluates eval interventions to help people quit smoking. Her work engages complex and disenfranchised groups, including people with serious mental illness, alcohol and drug problems, heart disease, the unemployed and the homeless. She has also helped develop, evaluate and disseminate curricula in cardiology and psychiatry as part of the treatment for change curriculum suite with over 7,500 registrants and um, 160,000 file downloads. With over 100 publications, Dr. Prochaska was recognised as the 2007 SRNT, that's Society for Research in Nicotine and Tobacco, Jarvik Russell Young Investigator Award and the 2010 NIDA Division of Clinical Neuroscience and Behavioural Research Outstanding Early Career Investigator. Uh, please welcome Dr. Prochaska. Well, thank you, Billy, and thank you all. I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, this is my fourth trip to Australia and the third in the last four years, and now it's my fourth state, and so I am getting a, a broader appreciation of your amazing country, really warm, welcoming uh, individuals, and of your government now, so it's been a really interesting trip. I also want to say that I'm pleased that tobacco is um, being so well attended to at your conference on alcohol and other drugs. Um, that it's, you know, that you have a keynote, that you've got dedicated sessions to it, that it was mentioned, uh, the impressive policies that the South Australia has done by the Parliamentary Secretary this morning, uh, that it was mentioned as well in Dr. Finnegan's talk on how uh, when a mother is smoking and using opiates that you've got an increased likelihood of neonatal uh, abstinence syndrome. Uh, so really pleased to see how well attended uh, tobacco is at this conference. So uh, I do want to mention that your own, your country has some really impressive researchers uh, in this area of tobacco and co-occurring disorders, Billy Benefsky, Amanda Baker, who I want to thank for uh, inviting me here, um, Jay, Jenny Bowman, Maxie Ashton. So I do want to really encourage you to seek out their work here at the conference as well. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a whirlwind tour of tobacco and mental health. Um, there are many slides in the beginning part with the epidemiology I'll go through more quickly so that we can really focus in on uh, recent evidence for treatment. And I'm pleased to, there's about four different studies that are brand new that have not yet been published or coming out in the next few months that I'll be showing today. My financial disclosures, I'm a principal investigator on a number of federal and state research awards. I also do ad hoc consulting work with Pfizer. And recently, I've done some expert witness work in litigation against tobacco companies. So my work focuses on uh, large clinical trials uh, addressing tobacco in, in individuals with mental health and addictive disorders. So I look at you know, fairly large data sets. The most recent ones are about 1,000 individuals. But it's the individuals that really touch home. And when I work with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, it really it reminds me why I do this work. Uh, so I want to start off talking about a case. Um, this is a man who was in one of our clinical trials. He was 56 years old. Uh, he did have serious mental illness, and he died during the course of the study. And because we're working with high-risk individuals, even though we're delivering fairly standard treatments, nicotine replacement therapy, motivational treatments, behavioral treatments, uh, because it's a vulnerable population and because there have been a lot of concerns that if you take away their tobacco, will they, will they uh, do worse, will they decompensate, uh, we follow them closely and we report any adverse events and serious adverse events to our data safety monitoring board. Uh, so this individual, he was 56 years old, he was gay identified, he was Caucasian. He had ha had over 15 psychiatric hospitalizations over a 10-year span. And he presented with severe depressive symptoms, suicide ideation, and auditory hallucinations, criticizing him and or commanding him to commit suicide. He tested positive for stimulants. And during his different presentations to the hospital, he received diagnoses of schizoaffective disorder, major depression with or without psychotic features, post-traumatic stress disorder, and polysubstance or stimulant dependence. 
Uh, when we met him, he was smoking two packs of cigarettes per day for 25 years. Uh, he had made 10 attempts to quit smoking, two in the past year. All of the attempts were unassisted, that is, without clinical support or use of any approved cessation medications. The longest period he was able to go free from tobacco was seven days, and he had not received any advice to quit smoking in the past year by a mental health or general medical provider. Uh, because he died, we sought out um, his medical coroner's report uh, that would detail what they thought the cause of death was. His landlord, he was living in a single residency occupancy hotel. Uh, his landlord thought that he was either a purposeful or accidental drug overdose. And when we got the report, the psychiatrist thought the same as did a friend. As we read through the report, there was no um, evidence of drugs in his apartment. Uh, there was an ashtray with some ash in it. Uh, there was no evidence of, of injury to the body and, or breaking into the apartment. And as we read through the report, uh, this individual, he didn't die from a substance use. He didn't die from suicidal um, uh, attempt. He died from um, his use of tobacco. He died from COPD, coronary obstructive pulmonary disease, and then he had right-sided heart failure, uh, which is also characteristic of COPD. So he died 20 years prematurely from complications of his smoking. And this is an individual who had repeatedly presented to the mental health care system, had opportunities for treatment, and yet never had used any evidence-based treatments for smoking cessation. So I'll be putting forth today that smoking and mental illness is a health disparity issue. Uh, we see elevated prevalence of use of tobacco in this group. We see targeted marketing by the tobacco industry to this group. The consequences are serious health disorders and, and morbidity, mortality, significant costs to the individuals as well as to society, as well as social isolation, enabling environments that continue this use of tobacco in this population uniquely from other, from other groups, lower access to treatment, and an inadequate research base. And so I'll be showing you each of these now. The prevalence. This paper is from 2000. It was published in JAMA by Karen Lasser. It is dated, but it's the first study to, to shine the light on the issue of tobacco use among those with, with mental illness. Uh, what you see is that the current smoking rate is double that in those with current mental illness compared to those with no mental illness. And you also see elevations among those with a history of mental illness. The different bars, the different color bars are different disorders, and you see especially high rates of tobacco use among those with alcohol or drug disorders, as well in this study among those with bipolar disorder. As I mentioned, those data are pretty dated. They're from 91, 92. There have been a number of studies since then uh, also showing elevated rates among those with current mental illness uh, compared to those with no mental illness. Uh, there's been very few studies that have looked at change over time, but this, these are data from New York State. What they found is that those who had good mental health had declines in tobacco use from over the decade, whereas those with poor mental health did not change much at all. I'm from San Francisco, from California area. California has the second lowest smoking prevalence in the U.S., second only to Utah, which has a very large Mormon population. When we were doing these studies, the smoking prevalence in San Francisco was 14%. When we looked in our insured patient population in an outpatient setting, 28% were smokers. In the inpatient setting, 45%. And this is from the county hospital, 60% uh, met criteria for, for um, were recent smokers. Not only do you see greater prevalence of use, but also heavier smoking among those with mental illness and among those with more severe mental illness. How about some data from Australia? Uh, so these, these slides, these next two are from Colin Mendelson from Sydney. Uh, one in three people with mental illness smokes in Australia. Uh, that's twice as likely as those with the general population. And you see greater smoking prevalence for those with more severe mental illnesses. Uh, depression, 36%. Bipolar disorder, 61%. Schizophrenia, 70%. Sorry. Uh, in California, or in uh, Australia, you've seen a decline in smoking over time, again, going down to about 18 percent. Uh, but that's not been seen among those with mental illness, and these are data focused on individuals with psychosis in Australia. Uh, again, very um, stable from 97 to, two, to 2010. What's, what about the targeting of tobacco among those with mental illness? Well, it's estimated that about 40% of the cigarettes sold, uh, this is true in the UK, the US, and in Australia, are sold to those with mental illness or addictive disorders. Uh, this, there was a study in New Zealand that estimated about a third. Uh, it's a huge amount of money for the tobacco industry, $39 billion in annual tobacco sales in the US, uh, $2.8 billion in Australia in annual tobacco excises. This, uh, advertise, oops, this advertisement here, 
uh, I found in the tobacco industry documents that you can find. It's a searchable database that the University of California, San Francisco maintains. And it's documents that were previously secret before the master settlement agreement in the states. Um, this one, it had schizophrenia at the top of the ad. Uh, schizophrenic at the top of the ad is for Merit cigarettes. It's a mirror image of a pack of cigarettes. And it talks about how it's got big taste, lower, tall, lower tar, all in one. For new merit, having two sides is just normal behavior. And we use this ad in our, in our treatment manuals with smokers who have mental illness to show them the ways in which they've been targeted by the industry. This is another um, media campaign it's from R.J. Reynolds, again focused uh, in the U.S. This is actually very close to home in the San Francisco area, in the Tenderloin area, which is a very low income area. Uh, many homeless, many uh, individuals who have substance use problems. And it was the subculture urban marketing campaign, which in-house R.J. Reynolds referred to as Project Scum. And the focus was on um, promoting tobacco use in this area and also pairing tobacco with other substances, like in head shops, uh, to encourage the use among those with addictive disorders. It took some time before they realized Project Scum was fairly pejorative, uh, and they changed the project name to Project Sourdough. And this is a picture of the area. So everywhere I go, people ask about e-cigarettes, and, and it seems like it's less of an issue for you in Australia, which is wonderful. I have not seen anybody smoking one yet. Um, but I do, you know, it, it is out there. It's on the horizon, so I will mention some of it uh, here. And we are seeing it in our, in our trials with individuals um, with mental illness. Currently, this is a recent study, there, there's about 500 brands of e-cigarettes, each with their own website, uh, 7,700 unique flavors in which you can get your e-cigarettes. Uh, what it is, it's a battery-operated device that it vaporizes uh, a liquid, nicotine liquid, or e-juice it's called, so that you don't get the carbon monoxide exposure and it, and it vaporizes um, the nicotine for the inhalation. Uh, these products are being marketed for special populations. There's one specifically made for uh, individuals who are in jails or prisons. It comes in orange, it's got a plastic casing, um, and we've got an editorial coming out in JAMA Psychiatry that talks about it. And they're talking about how it's, it's helpful to help with the, um, the, the budget deficits at the jails. And so they're actually using it to make money off the inmates. <laughs> yes, welcome to the U.S. Um, in terms of the advertising, you know, there's a lot of talk that e-cigarettes are, are very different from traditional cigarettes. They're not big tobacco. They, they are this, you know... Uh, this, this new product, and yet the advertising is very similar. And this is a traditional uh, camel cigarette pairing smoking with alcohol. Uh, here's one with the e-cigarette saying, welcome back, because you can bring your e-cigarette in e indoors. Uh, so again, you may be seeing these with your populations if you're working with people who have substance use disorders. This is an article from The Guardian, which is in the Bay Area, uh, talking about are e-cigarettes good for your mental health? And a lot of speculation in the article about how these might be helpful, including this quote that giving psychiatric patients access to e-cigarettes, particularly on closed wards, is definitely something to consider. And this quote actually comes from a colleague who I do go to meetings frequently with. Uh, and it's just unfortunate because the data are not yet out there. It's possible they, they could be helpful for harm reduction. They could be a useful tool for helping people quit. But we don't know. And I'll, I'll show you some data later that look, that's the, the, um, the extent of the evidence in terms of looking at them for cessation devices. Uh, so we are seeing increased use of e-cigs, particularly among those with mental health concerns. Uh, this is a, these are data from the U.S., about 10,000 is a national sample from 2012, uh, seeing more likely to try e-cigarettes in the full sample if they have mental health concerns, uh, particularly high if they're smokers with mental health concerns, 40% saying they tried e-cigarettes. Current use is about 9%, also nearly double of those without mental health concerns, and more likely to say that they're going to use an e-cigarette in the future. And this is a clinical trial we've been doing. We've been recruiting since 2009 before e-cigarettes were really out there. And now at 2013, we're getting reports that 25% of those enrolled in 2013 uh, said that they've used an e-cigarette in the last several months. We found that later year of enrollment, being younger, being non-Hispanic, and wanting to quit were all predictive of using e-cigarettes. Okay, serious health consequences, significant costs, and social isolation. 
Uh, so there's no other uh, misbehavior than like smoking. It's the number one preventable cause of death globally in the U.S. It's about 480,000 deaths each year from tobacco, and it's estimated about 180,000 of those are to individuals with mental illness or substance use disorders. It's estimated individuals with mental illness would die on average 25 years prematurely. I've seen similar data here in Australia. Uh, and those with m mental health concerns are at elevated risk for respiratory cardiovascular diseases and cancer compared to age match controls. We have also have studies i have seen that are um, more likely to be discharged against medical advice if you're a smoker and not offered nicotine replacement in inpatient psychiatry, uh, whereas if smokers are offered nicotine replacement, they look no different than non-smokers in terms of their against medical advice discharge rate. So it also impacts care. And I want to slow down on this one. Smoking, it's not the nicotine, it's the smoke uh, induces the metabolism, speeds up the metabolism of a number of psychiatric medications. It also does this for caffeine. Uh, so if you have an a client who's smoking um, and, and they're trying to quit smoking, um, if they quit smoking, then their metabolism levels may go up. Um, also, if they're in the hospital and it's a smoke-free setting and they get stabilized on their medications and then they leave and smoke, they can cut their med levels by like 50%, even as much as 80%. Uh, so it's a very relevant issue for a mental health practice. And again, it's the smoke, and it's the smoke in the liver inducing the metabolism. It's not the nicotine. Um, now, with more and more controls on where you can smoke, which is fantastic, limiting our exposure to secondhand smoke, uh, the issue with our population, however, is that they're going to get more and more isolated. And in surveys that we've done, three out of four of psychiatric patients who smoke report smoking most or all of their cigarettes while alone. Uh, they also spend a substantial amount of their incomes, particularly with the fixed income, on tobacco. In one study with out, outpatient smokers with schizophrenia, they spent over a quarter of their monthly incomes on tobacco. So why do individuals with, with mental illness smoke? Uh, smoking in adolescence is associated with a number of psychiatric disorders, uh, but we also see that active psychiatric disorders are associated with daily smoking and progression to nicotine dependence. Uh, there are some really nice prospective studies, including one that came out in early 2013, showing that smoking predicts new onset of anxiety and, and depressive disorders. Also, a really nice study from Israel showing that smoking predicted the development of schizophrenia. Um, but it's a very complicated issue, and, and there's not a lot of clarity there, and definitely a lot more research that needs to be done. Uh, so a number of factors that lead to why individuals with mental health smoke. Um, some of it, you know, definitely the conditioning effects, there's no other drug that's dosed as frequently as nicotine is with a cigarette. Um, they take the coping tool. They, they start smoking before they're 18. It may be the thing that they turn to in order to deal with stress and social interactions. Boredom is a big thing. Certainly, there's genetic predisposition and some indication of shared genetics between smoking and depression, alleviation withdrawal, the redu reduction of medication side effects. Uh, and then something I'm going to focus in on now is the systemic and treatment factors that are really truly unique to this population, and that's failure to, tre failure to treat in medicine and then also enabling environments. When I got interested in this work, I was new to the field, so I want to see how did we get here. This handbook was in our library from 1951. Um, and it's a primer or handbook for psychotherapists, and it asked in the behavior during the interview chapter, uh, should the therapist smoke during the interview? And the response was, why not? It will help drain the small amount of undischarged tension, which is always present during an interview, and it contributes to the naturalness of his behavior. Uh, also, in those legacy documents that I've mentioned, there have been researchers who have gone out to try to show the self-medication hypothesis. Uh, this is one from Canada titled Psychiatric Patients, Psychological, Behavioral, Physiological Investigations, uh, three studies, we promise to bear fruitful findings. Um, the psychiatrists who are medical professionals are very aware of the role of tobacco use and patients are very interested in these studies. If tobacco can be shown to be an efficient form of self-medication for these patients, then this would be a significant bonus for the tobacco industry. Uh, RJR commented that this individual has been totally dependent on our funding, and he's looking at this from our point of view. They did fund him. You see the checks going forward, uh, and yet nothing ever did get published that I've been able to find in the, in the, in the, um, in the literature. This is more recent from 1980. Uh, it's a letter from the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. This is a, a national institute writing to request a donation of cigarettes for long-term psychiatric patients because of recent changes at the hospital. We can no longer purchase cigarettes for them. Can you please send us 5,000 cigarettes a week? Uh, and this is from the medical director 
who is a very prominent schizophrenia researcher. And it's not to point fingers at the individuals, but just to show how much a part of the culture tobacco has been. I'll skip over this one so we can keep going. Uh, hospital smoking bans in the U.S. We banned tobacco in 93. In hospitals, there was this outcry that, that psychiatric patients should be able to smoke in their hospitals. There was a tidal wave of letters and petitions to the Joint Commission. It was organized by this woman who was part of the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. Uh, she said the group hasn't had any contact with the tobacco industry. And then as I looked, I found her business card in the documents with a letter to Philip Morris uh, saying, please help her. We're trying to ban this. We're trying to block the ban. And ultimately, JCO, the Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation, did um, give an exemption to psychiatric facilities to allow tobacco to continue in those settings. Um, there was an article that we helped uh, do. It took over two, about two years to do. It was a New York Times front page, which was fantastic. Um, this came out in 2013. There were a number of comments online about the article, and these are some of the comments that we saw. They weren't all like this but just to show that this, these kinds of uh, stigmatized feelings still do exist. Um, that it seems cruel to take smoking breaks away. Uh, if you're incarcerated in one of these institutions, and these are psychiatric institutions, these are not, this is not jail or prison, uh, you might not see it as a problem to shave five to ten years off your sentence. Um, the other one, so their cigarettes should be withheld so they can live longer. Uh, question. So is it inhumane to take away their cigarettes? Uh, this is what a smoker goes through in the course of a day. This is where they feel withdrawal symptoms. This is where they feel normal in the shaded area. And this is where they feel high um, from, their, from the nicotine. When a smoker gets up in the morning, if they've not smoked at night, and some of our clients do smoke at night, uh, they shoot up into the um, pleasure zone. And that's where you hear that first cigarette in the morning would be hardest to give up. As they go throughout the day, they're smoking every four minutes here. Not so much to feel pleasure and arousal, but to avoid the abstinence symptoms. They're smoking just to maintain and feel normal. They go to sleep at night, their body clears of nicotine, and it all starts over again in the morning. In inpatient psych facilities where they still allow smoking, they're not allowing smoking throughout the facility typically, and that's good. Uh, but what they're doing is they're lining people up to go out and smoke about every four hours. So what would that feel like if you're only allowed to go smoke every four hours? Okay, they're putting people down to the dumps of withdrawal and then shooting them back up into pleasure. And that's why you hear from staff, oh my gosh, we could never take away these smoke breaks. People are lining up, they're getting ready to go like 20 minutes ahead of time. It's because they're going through this uh, roller coaster feeling of withdrawal. Now if you're given the patch or the gum and lozenge, you get this nice steady delivery of nicotine replacement, much more humane than the cigarette that's given every four hours. There was an article in New Zealand that I was asked about recently. Um, this was in 2013, uh, where they cited my work. They were trying to block a hospital smoking ban, which they labeled as torture. Uh, and they said that my research had showed that banning psychiatric patients from smoking had little long-term effect. Um, that, the, that it also showed that people failed to give up long-term, uh, and that they're even more unmotivated than the rest of the community. So we had published some work where we just followed people after a smoking ban. We did see that most everybody smoked as soon as they were leaving. They were, the median time to first cigarette was five minutes. Most were going out on the curb and smoking. Uh, not happy about that. So I, if you guys, Charlie Brown and Lucy with their car, I thought up, well, what if I put a little Lucy card out there and I handed out patches as people were leaving? Um, so why were people going out and smoking so quickly? Well, the reason was because although this hospital was smoke-free and for some time, only about 70% were given nicotine replacement during the hospitalization. Only one had it on their treatment plan. Only two were advised to quit. Uh, and only four were provided nicotine replacement at discharge. In fact, some of the participants told me that they were told to remove the patch because the nurse knew that they were just going to go out and smoke anyway. Um, so if you're not provided treatment, then yes, most will return to smoking. Uh, so to write that record, bans alone without cessation treatment do result uh, in changes in motivation and beliefs around quitting. We have shown that in our work. Uh, but also return to smoking for hospitalization if they don't get treatment in the hospital. And that's consistent with what you see in general medical hospitals without psychiatric patients. Nancy Rigotti did a really nice meta-analysis with the Cochrane Review and showed that you have to have follow-up care outside of the hospital for at least one month if you want to impact smoking rates. Uh, and we've shown the same now with psychiatric hospitals, and I'll show you those data in a second. We've also showed that treatment was actually associated with reduced likelihood of being readmitted to the psych hospital. 
In terms of environments, it's just kind of a fun, nifty study that one of my postdocs did. She looked at uh, the density of tobacco retailers around the home environments of patients. Um, and each dot is an individual. The circles are group homes. These are the hospitals we recruited from. And the darker the area, the more tobacco retailers that are in that area. And we found that our population, our sample of psychiatric smokers, had twice the density of tobacco retailers in the environments in which they lived. And they had three retailers within 500 meters, 12 within a kilometer. The more dense the retailers in their environment, the greater psychosis uh, reported at baseline, the greater their um, reporting of self-harm, the more interpersonal problems, the greater their nicotine dependence. Also, the more dense the retailer environment around them, the lower their belief that they can quit smoking, and the lower their motivation to quit. Access to treatment. This is a survey from 2006 in the U.S. Um, many providers said that they ask about tobacco two-thirds. Less than half assess readiness to quit. Less than a quarter were providing assistance. Only 14% were arranging follow-up, 11% referring to others. And psychiatrists were the least likely to address tobacco with their patients. Uh, less than internal medicine docs, OBGYNs, and family medicine. When we asked um, smokers themselves, have you been advised to quit smoking by a doc? Uh, this was a study with uh, about 700 smokers with bipolar disorder online. A uh, few reported that a psychiatrist, therapist, or case manager ever advised them to quit, and several reported discouragement to quit from health providers, mental health providers. Why don't they address tobacco with their patients? Many believe their patients aren't motivated to quit, that there's more acute problems, few programs available. They're not going to quit. There's other practice um, priorities. Staff are unfamiliar and limited time with patients. And I'll take you through to, to counter some of these beliefs. P smokers with mental illness are just as ready to quit smoking as the general population. You see about 20% in the general population are intending to quit in the next 30 days, about 40% in the next six months. No difference for those with general psych outpatients, um, depressed outpatients, psych inpatients, or methadone clients. And further, that there's no relationship between severity of psychiatric symptoms and readiness to quit. And let's get into the research. So the update of the clinical practice guidelines in 2008 um, had over about 8,700 research articles. I mean, there's no other risk behavior that's so well, well studied than tobacco. Um, so fantastic to have all this literature. When you look at the gold standard, randomized controlled trials to treat tobacco dependence and looking at individuals with mental health or addictive disorders, there's less than 30 studies. Okay, so consuming about 40% of the smoke cigarettes that are sold, less than 30 randomized controlled trials. I literally can take you through each of them, um, but I'll summarize. Quit lines are very important. You know, if, if docs are worried about time that it's going to take, referring to a quit line takes less than five minutes. In California, they looked at the callers to the quit line, and they found that one in four callers met criteria for major depression. So they are seeing this in the call centers. At two months, yes, those with depression were less likely to quit, but 19% were quit at two months, and this is just from a quit line. So really valuable treatment, making that referral. Uh, and then thinking through, you know, what other supports might be needed, but again, 19% quit is really fantastic. The, the Veterans Administration System in the U.S. is looking to have more warm handoffs with their quit line and more focus around mental health. In the state of Arizona, they have a pharmacist online to talk about mental health and um, psychiatric medication interactions uh, for smokers who call. So there's ways to, to beef up the quit line to have more attention to those with mental health concerns. So I'll present some, some data. We've been doing some work in inpatient psychiatry to address tobacco. Uh, this is in hospitals that are smoke-free, so there's this window of opportunity to address tobacco use with the patients, and they're there about a week uh, on average. We do stage-tailored systems. They don't have to want to quit smoking to be in our study. We just come up to them and say, We're part of the, you want to be part of the smoking study. You don't want to have to quit. There's no pressure. We meet you where you're at. Um, there's a computer system, a manual that they get to take home, nicotine patches if they would like it, uh, and we compare that to usual care where they just get a brochure. In this first study, we had 224 patients enrolled. They had a full range of psychiatric diagnoses. 79% of those who we went up to to ask to be in our study said yes, and we were very liberal with our inclusion criteria. And we retained 81% in 18 months. This is the sample. Um, mix of diagnoses, about half with unipolar depression, 15% with schizophrenia, 
most involuntarily admitted. Um, their mental health functioning was two standard deviations below the general population, so the fairly ill population. Um, and they've been regular smoker for 20 years, about a pack a day. Uh, three out of four smoked within 30 minutes of waking. And we were pleased that only 16% said they wanted to quit in the next 30 days. We were able to recruit and engage people who were not ready to quit smoking. I mean, again, they're there for suicidality, homicidality, grave disability. And we're there saying, hey, do you want to be a part of this smoking study? These are the components, as I mentioned. There's a computer system that asks about their readiness to quit, their beliefs and their ability to quit, the pros and cons of quitting, their engagement in different processes of change. Um, there's a manual so that they've got something to take home. This does have a printed report that links to the manual. They meet with us for about 15 to 30 minutes. It's not a long encounter. And they can get 10 weeks of nicotine patch from us when they're ready to quit. They do that computer system on, it, during the hospital. And then again, at three and six months, the computer remembers them and tells them how they've changed and progressed over time. These are some screenshots where it's looking at the pros and cons of quitting. Um, if they're not ready to quit, we have them monitor their use and see how it relates to isolation and their mood. We talk about different strategies for change, substitutes that they can use, including nicotine replacement. We've done formative work, and we've heard from our patients, you know, this, this feels very non-judgmental. There's a space for me. Um, I'm not, you know, for the first time, I'm not feeling judged. She's not pushy, that kind of thing. Uh, and these are the data. So it was published in the American Journal of Public Health. Um, the green line is usual care. And over time, we're seeing significant uh, increases in quitting in the treatment group relative to usual care, with 20% quit at 18 months, uh, compared to about 8% in the usual care group. Um, this is self-reported and then confirmed with a breath sample. So exciting. We help people, oops, we help people quit smoking, but did we do any harm? Uh, about half of our patients were rehospitalized in the 18 months of the study that we followed them. Um, so, and that sounded alarming until we found out that for the state in California, 44% of patients hospitalized in psychiatry get rehospitalized within a year. And our study was over 18 months, so it's actually pretty comparable. But we had 234 rehospitalizations. Um, being rehospitalized was unrelated to, to their quit status, whether they quit smoking or not. It was related to race, uh, psychosis symptoms at baseline, prior psychiatric hospitalizations, uh, having unstable housing, and their study condition, in that more rehospitalizations were seen in usual care than in the treatment group. And when we controlled for these factors, it still remained significant uh, that usual care had significantly more rehospitalizations in the treatment group. Um, I've not seen data out there like this before. It certainly needs to be replicated, but at a minimum, we did no harm uh, from what we're seeing in terms of treating their tobacco and their rehospitalization rates. There's a paper that's coming out shortly uh, in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, where we also looked at cost effectiveness of the intervention. And Paul Barnett, who's the health economist on this study, was thrilled. He said he's never seen anything like this, that it was such a treat um, cheap intervention, you know, computerized, brief contact, nicotine patch, which is available over the counter. We got significant effects on quitting smoking, and we actually had less rehospitalizations. The cost is $428 per quality adjusted life year. Um, so again, really exciting, and we're hoping that this leads to greater adoption. We've taken that work, which was in, a, in an academic hospital, we've taken it over to our county hospital, public hospital, where patients are uninsured. Um, to see could we replicate the findings, um, much more ethnic diversity, lower income, more homelessness, more substance use. And we had very similar um, quitting. This is in the um, private hospital, which I just showed you, and at 12 months, and this is in the county hospital, um, also showing very nice quit rates uh, increasing over time. Uh, this work was Prior to this was done with depressed smokers and outpatient psychiatry, 322 depressed smokers, similar treatment model compared to a contact control group. And again, significant effects out at 12 and 18 months with 25% quit at 18 months compared to 19% in the control group, again with bioconfirmation of abstinence. Further likelihood of quitting was unrelated to the baseline depression severity. We looked again, did we do any harm? We helped depressed smokers quit smoking. Does that, you know, does that cause them to decompensate? Uh, we saw no increase in suicidality, no increase in psychiatric hospitalization, comparable improvements in percent of days with emotional problems, and no difference in use of marijuana, stimulants, or opiates. It's not like they started using other drugs to compensate. And they actually, we had less alcohol use among those who quit smoking. 
And this shows their depression scores on the back depression inventory coming down uh, over time. They're in treatment for depression. They're treated for their tobacco use. And if they quit smoking or continue to smoke, there was no difference in their mental health recovery. So really nice replication here uh, among those in inpatient psychiatry, depressed smokers. And it's actually very similar to what we see in the general population using these types of interventions. Okay, so moving into to other work, uh, I'll show you some, some medication trials. This is Renaclean in smokers with depression. This came out in 2013, Robert Antonelli. Uh, 525 adult smokers with stably treated or past depression, so some more stabilized. Uh, what you see is that Renaclean does significantly better than placebo at 9 to 12 weeks, up to 24 weeks, and out to 52 weeks. Um, they did not see differences in suicide ideation or worsening of uh, depression. The most frequent AE was nausea. Also, Vernaclean's been tested in smokers with schizophrenia. Um, the first was a 12-week open-label study with 112 stable outpatients. Uh, continuous absence rates was 34%. And then a randomized control trial. This is uh, Jill Williams as the lead author here. Uh, significant at end of treatment. Um, not significant at 24 weeks, although I think it's more of the sample size and the lack of power because it was about 12% compared to 2%. Also, Baron and Clean found to be well tolerated, no evidence of symptom exacerbation. Um, Eden Evans published at the beginning of this year in JAMA a really nice study looking at Veronicline for maintenance treatment uh, with smokers with schizophrenia, showing significant effects. Uh, she had patients who started on Veronicline. Among those who were quit at 12 weeks, she then randomized to continued Veronicline or placebo. She had 87 people who met that, to met that stage of the study. And at one year, 60% of those who were continued on running clean were quit, compared to 19% in the placebo. Out to 76 weeks when they're off running clean, 30% were quit. Bupropion also has been shown to be helpful for quitting smoking uh, for smokers with schizophrenia. Uh, and the relative risk is actually stronger. The effect is even stronger in this group than in the general population. And it's because if you give a placebo drug to a smoker with schizophrenia, they're not going to quit. Uh, you give them an active drug like bupropion, uh, they had nice quit effects, also well tolerated. There is a box warning on, on Veronaclean. Um, I believe you guys are, if you're not aware of that, is that if the patient experiences any changes in behavior, agitation, uh, suicidal um, behavior, that they are to stop the drug immediately. There have been a number of studies, more observational studies, to see what's going on in the general population because the box warning was due to case reports to the FDA. Uh, and what was seen is that there was actually a, a big uh, jump in reporting to the FDA when a regulatory warning came out. And so there's some concern that some of that might be simulated reporting. Uh, this is, these are data from the UK that looked at, ooh, I don't have it, but about 100,000, I believe, um, individuals out in the community who are using either Veronaclean, Bupropion, or NRT, sorry. Uh, 19,000 using NRT, 1,600 with Bupropion, 7,300 with Veronaclean. Uh, so about... 80,000, 90,000. Uh, what they found, and they used um, a number of different statistical techniques because these are observational data, they found no increase in terms of fatal, non-fatal self-harm or treated depression among those treated with veronicline or bupropion compared to NRT. And then there's been several other. These are data from the VA, again, not seeing any increase in um, inpatient or outpatient neuropsychiatric diagnoses in the VA if somebody's treated with veronicline compared to NRT. Uh, another one, uh, Vernicline was actually, um, had greater quit rates and um, actually lower neuropsychiatric AEs compared to NRT. Looking in PTSD, there's been um, two really nice studies that have been done by Miles McFall's group where they've integrated cessation services into the PTSD clinic. Um, they've trained clinicians to, to bring it in and seeing how that compares to referral out to the quit services in the VA, which are very strong. Um, they have five sessions in total. They get access to cessation medications. And in the initial pilot, they found that medication use was greater, 94% using meds compared to 64% in the usual care. They got more cessation treatment, six sessions compared to about three in usual care. And the likelihood of quitting was five times greater for the integrated care versus usual care. This then led to a very large, it was a 10-site randomized control trial study in the VAs across the U.S. with nearly 1,000 veterans. Uh, where they did a train-the-trainer model. They brought the clinicians to a central place, one from each setting, and then sent them back home to train their colleagues. 
They delivered the care, and again, they got two, this time a two-fold increase in quitting relative to the usual care. And this was published in JAMA in 2010. Further, they found that quitting smoking had no detriment on PTSD symptoms. So to summarize, the support for currently available interventions, um, treatments matched to motivation, NRT, bupropion, vernaclean are helpful for these populations. Tr tobacco treatment does not appear to harm mental health recovery, and integration to mental health treatment settings increases the receipt of care and abstinence rates. I'm going to stop there so that we've got five minutes for questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You tell a compelling story on why we should address tobacco smoking with our clients, Jody. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions now. Great, thank you. Thank you for that question. So in the um, studies that were included in the meta-analysis of using propion with patients with schizophrenia, they were all stably treated individuals with schizophrenia. So they were stabilized on their medications, and that is something uh, to keep in mind. And they showed no adverse effects of propion. So I understand your concerns, but didn't see um, what, what you're indicating. And then, and then with the PTSD trial, similarly, they didn't report any adverse effects. Now, that's, that's not to say that if you have a client that you're working with, if they're getting more activated, agitated, if they're have, having trouble sleeping, uh, for smoking cessation, you can actually not do that second dose of apropion. Uh, and that's been shown to be effective. Just having the 150 milligrams is effective for quitting smoking relative to placebo. Um, so absolutely monitor the patients that you have. Be considerate of what they're going through. Are they stably treated? Um, but in the literature with the randomized controlled trials, they're not showing adverse effects of using those medications in stably treated individuals with schizophrenia and PTSD. Thanks. Yeah, great question. So am I concerned about the tobacco or the nicotine? I'm concerned about the tobacco. So, so the tobacco is absolutely the carbon monoxide, the carcinogens that are in cigarettes. Um, if you can get an individual off of tobacco on long-term nicotine replacement therapy, patches, gum, the, the inhalator, that would be fantastic. Um, the e-cigarette is this emerging phenomenon that is just hitting the market with such gangbusters um, that it is a little, it's concerning. Um, but where the concern is, not so much, I mean, if you've got a long-term smoker who's able to, to switch over completely to the e-cig uh, and maintain that long-term, it's probably going to be a lot better for them than continuing their combustibles. Um, but the concern is, is that most e-cigarette users, at least in the States, are dual users. They're smoking their e-cigarette at work or at school or in, in, in movie theaters, you know, places where they can serendipitously, you know, in hiding, use it, and then smoking their normal cigarettes when they go home. So they're getting even more nicotine exposure. And then even more concerning is that in the U.S., you've got gummy bear flavor, cotton candy, daiquiri. I mean, who are they targeting? Are they targeting that chronic smoker, or are they targeting the future smokers? Um, so having kids have full access. We've got e-cig vendors in the malls, kiosks. We've got vape houses. Um, we, we, and then also that kids can, or anybody could use these things to smoke um, dabs, which are marijuana. Uh, and you could be smoking this in the bathroom at your high school, and nobody would know. You could be smoking this in your bedroom, and your parents wouldn't know. So it's just a lot of concern about the lack of regulation, um, the marketing to youth, and all, and all of those factors. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Yes, yes, by the candles. New England Journal, right, yep. Um, right, so the first study we did, um, the one that just came out in 2014, we did just do one patch. Some of that, that was cost, and because we were the first time getting into this hospital and trying to get them to use it, and the hospital didn't use combination NRT at the time. Uh, now with the study that we're doing, where we've got about 1,000 participants, we offer a patch with gum or lozenge, so we do absolutely use combination NRT. And I think that is a really important modality to use. That's, that's thrilling to hear that you're using it in practice. Um, so absolutely, if you've got someone who's a fairly heavy smoker, uh, using combination NRT is recommended. Um, in terms of the, the New England Journal of Medicine article, yeah, so the Kendalls, who um, a Nobel Prize laureate and, and such, uh, we've done a lot of work on, on nicotine uh, and have done some work in rats showing that if you expose to nicotine first and then to cocaine, you get much more of a, a potentiation of the addiction to cocaine. Uh, whereas if you do cocaine first and then nicotine, you don't see this reverse effect. And so they're um, talking about the gateway effect, that if you, if you start and initiate people on the drug of nicotine, is that going to increase the likelihood that they go on to harder drugs of use? Uh, and, we, and we just don't know. Could e-cigarettes do that? Uh, very, very well could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, often find patients, they want to give up, they haven't given up other drugs, but they always, you know, keep their nicotine to last. I wonder if you know, there's any data to suggest that things might be better giving up altogether or, or things that you can find to sort of help that. Like, yep, great question. So is it better to, to, to deal with one drug at a time and then get rid of nicotine, or, or could you quit smoking and your other drugs at the same time? And it's definitely one that comes up among clients that you'll see, providers, and, and out in the research literature. So there's a meta-analysis that I did, and now it's, it's 10 years old, uh, now in 2014, so we are working to update it, uh, where we look to see what, what effect is um, working with people to quit smoking when they're in addictions treatment or in recovery, which meant that they were sober for at least a year. Uh, we found significant post-treatment effects. They, those treatments were successful in getting people to quit smoking at the end of treatment, but then we did see relapse at the long-term follow-up. And I think some of that is that we've been so cautious in treating tobacco in addiction treatment settings that we haven't gone forward with the, the best evidence that we can, the most aggressive treatments that we could do. Then we looked to see, well, did it hurt their sobriety if, they, if we treated them for tobacco? Uh, and this is a meta-analysis, so I'm combining randomized controlled trial data. You don't get the real fine-grained analysis. Um, but what we saw is that there was actually increased likelihood of sobriety uh, in, this, in the conditions that received the treatment compared to the control conditions. And it was a 25% increased likelihood of sobriety at long-term follow-up. Um, so that was exciting. It, it showed that it didn't hurt recovery, and it may have even helped uh, long-term recovery. And then there's been a number of observational studies showing that people who are quit smokers or former smokers, they're more likely to be long-term sober. Um, those aren't randomized trials, but more observational. Yep. Great. All right, we might end it there. Thank you, and, and please thank uh, Dr. Pachaska again.